So this class is being recorded for your information. And it is being recorded because of various reasons. Reason number one is for authenticity purposes. Reason number two is for the sake of those people who will be joining us later. And reason number three is for recording purposes, uh, is for, 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 for records purposes. Uh, last week, uh, there are people who joined us and we started this particular lesson. And I gave assignment and assignment, assignment one, and they were able to do it. And I marked that particular, uh, those are particular activities. That was an assignment one. And today, we are also going to have an assignment and a discussion. My friends, if you are here, you must do those discussions and those assignments. Otherwise, if you don't do it, register now has been synchronized to those with those assignments and uh, those assignments and what? Those assignments and discussions. If you don't do it, the register marks you absent automatically. And we know very well that one of the conditions for you to sit for an exam, you must have attained at least 75% of the class attendance. So if you do not do those activities, all of them, then the system marks you automatically absent. So you have to do all those activities. You have no choice and to do those activities. If you fail to do the activities, you will also fail to do the exam. Your pattern is clearly understood. So activities are mandatory. You have to do them, the system to actually mark you present. Don't come complaining to me. Mualibu, you have marked me absent. You have marked me absent. I was in class. I can tell you everything that you do, but, uh, uh, and you marked me absent. No, it is not me. It is the system. The system follows rules. It follows conditions. So it has been conditioned such that you will have to do all the activities, discussion forum, and the quiz. Today, you will do discussion forum, the quiz, or the system actually mark you present. If you don't do them, then it will mark you uh, absent. That is, uh, by 5 p.m., you must have done those activities and completed them. Area to which the system marks you absent. Don't come telling me, Mr. Maina, you have marked me absent. It is not me. It is you who have marked yourself absent by not doing those activities. So, all said and done, let us go to our first lesson, our second lesson. And our second lesson, we are uh, looking at uh, this particular topic. And uh, this particular topic is known as uh, verbal communication. Our second topic is verbal communication, yes. I'm sharing my notes very soon. I am sharing my notes to you, to you very soon. So focus and follow through. Also said last week that uh, make sure that you have the right gadget, a good gadget, a gadget that does not overheat. If you have a phone or a laptop, once you go to the internet, it overheats. You're lying to yourself, that's not a laptop. It's not a laptop. So again, when you are preparing yourself for this lesson, make sure that you are seated somewhere free from noise. Minimize the noise that is around you as much as possible. And also take notes, take notes because these notes will help you in revision. Will help you, will help you in revision. So take notes, don't just listen to me as though you are listening to the latest mixtape by DJ Demakufu or DJ Writer. Don't listen to me as though you are listening to that. Eh? That one will not be learning. That one will be, actually will be waste of time. It will be a waste of time. I'm going to maximize my screen 
that we can all see our, our, our my notes. Now, I'm starting my class, and today we are looking at verbal communication. Sometimes we call it oral communication. And when you talk about oral communication, this is a means of communication, word of mouth. When you communicate through word of mouth, like I am doing, um, like what I'm doing right now, I am doing oral communication. And this is the primary form of human communication. So it is the use of spoken language that give or give human a great advantage over animals. Animals do not speak. Animals do not speak. They produce sound to depict something. Like if you hit a dog, it will produce a certain sound. It does not speak. Now it will use, uh, it will produce a certain sound to communicate something, but it will not speak. You must be very careful to differentiate between speaking and communicating. Speaking is when you use your mouth to say some words or to, to, uh, to say some words. Or to convey some communicate or to convey some message. Communication is the process of sending a certain message from the sender to the receiver. When you hear your bar, your dog barking at night, it tries to communicate something that maybe there is a strange thing in the compound, or there is a strange person in the compound, or something of the sort. It tries to communicate through producing a certain sound. So the difference between human beings and animals is that human beings can speak, animals cannot speak. So that is the greatest, uh, greatest advantage between human beings and animals. Then we look at advantages of oral communication. One it is a learnable and improvable human activity. One advantage of human uh, oral communication, it is a learnable and improvable human activity. Every day we learn. Every day we improve. Like the way you are when you are when you are small. You kept on improving on your oral communication. Until now, you can now speak fluently. You can now speak we can understand what you are saying. When you are young, would not, we could not understand what you are saying. We could not understand because even the words were not coming up, out clearly. But if you not, uh, yeah, the words were not coming up clearly, but right now, words are coming out clearly. We can hear what you are saying, and we can, uh, we, we, we can do what we can answer you if at all you are asking a question. So it is a learnable and improvable human activity. It's something that we learn and we improve. Secondly, it's a more accurate reflection of thoughts and attitude of the speaker. So the moment I speak, then you can reflect on what I'm thinking. Like if I have, a, a, I'm having a conversation maybe between, uh, let me pick one of you. Kate, Kate Thuku, that's a CBM student. And Kate Thuku is talking to me. I can know what she's thinking. I will know what she's thinking through her verbal communication. So it's a more accurate reflection of your thinking. So the moment you speak, we can tell what you are thinking. Number three, it creates a, and sustains warm interpersonal relationship. Something interpersonal, something between two or more people. Like last week, we looked at interpersonal communication. You remember, we looked at types of communication, those who joined our class or those who came to class. We looked at types of communication or uh, types of communication. One of it was interpersonal communication. We said interpersonal communication is communication between one or more people. When I'm communicating to two of my friends, 
through my friend, then it is called what we call interpersonal communication. So it creates and sustains warm interpersonal relations. It's through verbal communication that we are able to uh, uh, express ourselves very well. Like for example, if you are called, come and explain why you did not do a cut, you will be able to express yourself very well and clearly than if you are to write a letter, than if you are to send us a video, or than if you are to send us an oral communication, because there will be questions and answers. We'll be asking you questions, you'll be answering uh, the, the, the questions and so on and so forth. So it creates and sustains warm interpersonal relationships. Number four, it combines sight and sound. Therefore, it enables participants to benefit from both the verbal and the verbal stimulus. Stimulus is anything that you can see or touch, something that can motivate you, depending on your need. For example, if you are hungry, the stimulus is food. If you are, um, if you are sick, the stimulus is medicine. If you are thirsty, the stimulus is cold drink or water. So it combines sight and sound, and therefore it enables participants to benefit from verbal and nonverbal communication. But I can see, as we speak, I can look at your face. I can be able to tell whether you are happy or you are sad. For example, right now you cannot see my face, so you can't tell whether I am happy or sad. Through the voice, through the tone of voice, you, or tonal voice, you can be able to tell this lecturer is, is, is good or this lecturer is bad. This lecturer has no, has no grudge with anybody. It combines sight and sound, and therefore, through the sight and sound, you can be able to interpret the message that you are being given by someone. Number five, it allows for instantaneous exchange of ideas, information, opinion, feelings, and attitudes. You can communicate with someone instantly. When you ask a question, that person can answer you, you directly. If, they, if you need information, he can give you information directly. And you can respond directly. So it is very instant. instant. You don't have to wait two weeks, for three weeks, for one day. Somebody is saying that my video cannot be seen on his screen. Now, how do we help this one? Because I've already shared my screen. I think I can ask some of you that you can see my screen, that you know we know where the problem is. Can you see my screen? Kofi? Kofi Ocheng, can you see my screen? Asimu Niu, can you see my screen? Is happening. Kwa nini watu hawataki kuongea na mko nyumbani? Don't you want to talk and you are at home? What if the class was physical? Kiungekuwa usha faint. Kiulizwa swali kama hiyo. Anyway, Juma Abud, can you see my screen? Now what kind of a behavior is this? Can anybody tell me whether you can see my screen? Somebody is complaining here, he can't see my screen. Anybody can answer that. Juma Abid, can you unmute yourself? I can see you are raising your hand. Can you unmute yourself?
Yes, I'm seeing your screen. Thank you. Yes. I can see people have responded. They can see the screen. I don't know why this uh, person, his name is, uh, I can I can hear you, sir. Uh, so those who are writing me messages that uh, I'm a new student, I have just joined this week. Right now I'm in class. I cannot read your messages and at the same time teach. Iso maswali yuko nazo, tafadhali utaniuliza baadaye, ama utaniambia yu story yako baadaye. The next point is, uh, it enables participant to seek immediate clarification whenever in doubt of the meaning being negotiated. For example, I'm assuming you have just gone to buy something, you've just gone to buy a radio, you've just gone to buy a flat screen. To enable you what to make clarification on the price, the item, make on a clarification on whether there is what we call a sale service, that is transportation. It will give you an opportunity, an unverbal, as in verbal communication, gives you an opportunity to ask whether, in case this machine I'm buying, this or whatever laptop I'm buying, in case it spoils within seven days, can I return it back? So it helps you to do what? Seek clarification or issue uh, whenever you're in doubt. For example, after this class, there are those people most probably that will ask questions because they are in doubt, they did not understand uh, what I meant by saying uh, something or what I meant by saying this or that. So it provides for instantaneous feedback through verbal communication. You can get feedback immediately, and therefore making it possible for the participant to assess failure or success of their communication. Like when you ask for clarification, uh, actually checking whether these people have understood what you have said or not. So those are what we call uh, advantages of oral communication. Remember, whatever has advantages, it also has disadvantages. Number one, disadvantages of oral communication. Remember oral communication, communication through the word of mouth. Lacks permanence. Lacks permanence. It lacks permanence. You cannot, as the moment we speak with you on an open field, you cannot prove that really I told you something. For example, when you go to buy a piece of land, that piece of land is sold, I mean, it's sold to you through word of mouth. So he, somebody comes to you, tells you, I'm selling this piece of land. I'm selling this machine, laptop, then this person, not even laptop, let's talk about a piece of land, to give this person 2.5 million. Following day when you come, you find another person has taken the land, and has started already fencing the land. You can't say, you can't prove that this land is yours because the land was sell, sold to you by two word of mouth. It lacks permanence. Lacks proof. But two, it does not allow participants or to crystallize. Therefore, resulting into what we call precise communication and even outright errors, which could be avoided in written communication. Remember, in written communication, before you write something, you have to think about it carefully. Before you put any words, have to think about it carefully. Like, like, uh, now, in oral communication, before you even answer, if, when somebody asks you a question, the, when you are talking, you, you, you may find yourself responding to the question very fast without even thinking of what you are saying. So in other words, it does not allow participants thought to crystallize. I, 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 I remember I had a friend of mine whom when you would talk to him, he will respond or he will talk much. Or he might, he might even say or 
might even say some things he did not want to say. Then he be, uh, he be, he will be left saying, "This poor, I mean, this big mouth of mine." In other words, uh, non, uh, oral communication does not allow participants to not crystallize. Therefore, it results to size communication and even outright errors, which could be avoided in written communication. Number three, there is a possibility of distortion of meaning. When we talk with someone verbally, chances are this person may also distort the meaning. You've heard our politician, for example, some few years back, somebody said Mexico, that they're importing maize from Mexico. And sometimes back, they say, no, I did not say Mexico. I said maize eco. And you wonder, is this person taking us for fools? So there is a possibility of distortion of meaning. People may distort the meaning that is uh, passed across to them. Can easily be denied. I can easily say, no, it was not me. Me, I did not say such a thing. I did not say it is your own thinking and trying to put words in my mouth. I did not say that. It can easily be denied. But five, it has little weight as a contextual evidence. That's like we said, when you have, you are buying a piece of land or you are buying um, something in the shop, then it has to be there. There must be a document, a written document, show that you have bought it and you are now the legal owner of that property. Even when you are buying a television set from a shop, they give you a receipt to show that you are you have bought the item. So you cannot just give someone money and he gives you a television set without what, without a written document person might come in the evening and take his television set. And if you are asked to prove that really you bought the TV, then it becomes very difficult to prove. So it has little weight as a contractual evidence. You cannot uh, prove in the court of law. Say he told the court of law will ask you where is the evidence. So oral communication. Those are the disadvantages of oral communication. Any question up to that point? Any question? If there is no question, then let's look at verbal messages and misunderstanding. Misunderstandings are facts of life. It is very true. We expect to be misunderstood. And uh, even in class, we expect students to misunderstand us. And those are facts of life. The process of encoding and decoding is not perfect. Decode, encode is to, uh, to, to, to try and understand the meaning. Decode is to do what? Put the meaning across. You are putting the meaning across. When God is to try and understand the meaning. Now, to encode simply means try and uh, put your meaning across. For example, if you have some information in your mind, when you put it in form of uh, a written document or you communicate what is in your mind, that one is what we call encoding. When you communicate your thoughts to us, when you communicate your ideas to us, you know the ideas are in the mind. When you do that, you are encoding. To decode is the opposite of encoding. To decode is to try and understand what you have written, is to try and understand what you are saying, to try and understand what you have just done, or to try and understand what kind of communication you are trying, maybe through uh, through painting or through, through, through photographs 
or through an action. When we try to understand what you have done is what we call decoding. So misunderstanding a fact of life and the process of encoding and decoding is not perfect. The way we understand things, the way we translate things is not perfect. And because most of the basic language problems involve misunderstanding, now we are beginning to look at how to prevent this type of miscommunication because miscommunication most of the time comes from verbal communication or oral communication or communication through the word of mouth. So number one, you are being told to avoid this, use what we call unequivocal terms to avoid misunderstanding. So unequivocal terms are those with two different meanings that are both acceptable and they are common. So you can use a term that has got two different meanings and people will end up misunderstanding you. So most equivocal misunderstanding arises in causal conversation, causal conversation where statement seems perfectly clear until you discover that others can interpret them differently. Like for example, come up with a statement like uh, your neighbor uh, is a dog. How can we translate that communication? Your neighbor is a dog. Or you have a neighbor is a dog. No, your neighbor is a dog, that is it. Eh? How will you understand that statement? That's an equivocal term. When we say your neighbor is a dog. We have some people in this class. When we say your neighbor is a dog, what do we mean? Uma, your, your hand is still up. When we say your neighbor is a dog, how will people understand that message? Yeah, some people have raised their hands. Let me check that person who has just raised his hand. Abiba Abdile. Abdile. Talk to us. You want me to unmute you? Uh, I'm un I've un unmuted you. Abiba, you can talk. You it means bad? quarreling like that means quarreling. Arguing. Arguing. Something of that sort. That just don't go into details. Finding uh, the deep meaning <laughs> of your neighbor is a dog. Just take it lightly. Just take it the way it is. Don't go into details. Into, yeah, into details. Just go, just don't, don't go into so much details. Get to we say your neighbor is a dog, what do we mean? How can you mean? It's oh. a... Personally, I'll take it as abusive. You'll take it as abusive, yes. Somebody else. We have somebody else talk to us. We say your neighbor is a dog. We have somebody else talk to us. Anyway, I couldn't attack one there. Means comparing your neighbor to a dog. It means comparing your neighbor to a dog. Apart from comparing your neighbor to a dog, your neighbor might simply be a dog. That it comes there or it is close to you. Your neighbor can simply be the animal or the dog. It is true. People may understand it like that. But you have an animal as your dog. Others will understand that your neighbor is, uh, it, okay, the, 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 it might mean it is abusive. It might mean that that person is quarreling you. So 
stop using such words. They can be mis misunderstood differently. And maybe simply you mean your neighbor is the animal, an animal, a dog, eh? a dog. So stop using uh, an equivocal terms because uh, people are going to translate them differently and uh, people will take them differently. Like for example, like, uh, if I was to invite somebody for a cup of tea, assume I'm inviting uh, Elvis for a cup of tea and I tell Elvis, on Wednesday we are going to have a cup of tea. When is there at five? That's an equivocal term because we don't understand which when is it. Is it the last Wednesday of the year, December? Or is it this coming Wednesday? Or is it last Wednesday of the month of January? So stop using such word because people will translate them differently. Number two, you are told to use lower level abstraction and clarity is necessary. Any object or idea can be described at various levels, some very general and some very general and others specific. In other words, stop using ambiguous language. It causes problem. It causes problem. Uh, for example, when you tell your supervisor you will do memo soon, it can cause problem. You tell your supervisor, I will do the memo soon. What is soon? Sometimes you find people saying, oh, I mean, when someone tells you, I'll call you very soon. And somebody might add, how soon is very soon? You, you will find somebody saying very soon supposed to be specific. For example, if you tell your boss, the job will take a little longer. You need to clarify how much longer, how many hours, how many days, how many weeks. You want to tell your boss, I'll be done very soon. And maybe very soon is in a month type, is in a year's type. So stop using what we call lower level abstraction. Then is what we call using slang. Avoid using slang. Eh? Use of slang with use slang with caution. It is causal slang. Head and speech may be fine when conversing with friends, conversing with fr family, other informal communication situation. It can create a very wrong impression with bosses. It can create a very wrong impression with teachers. Some slang may simply not be understandable to some people. So to Nasema Hivi, Vijana, I know you are mean in Vijana, you are very young. When you are you get into the offices, when you're talking to your lecturers, when you get into the bank, stop using slang. Slang may make someone carry you in a different angle. For example, when we speak of slang, people think of ghetto. When you think of ghetto, think of a place where there is no Laws and order. By Utapataya Kwamba Kuna Wizi, the smuggling of weapon, the smuggling of drugs. People are living a life that is not um, that is not secure or something of the sort. So use slang with caution. You can speak, you can use slang with your friends, with your family. When it comes to other people, it may take you negatively. For example, assume you've been called for an interview. Then you use two or three slang words. People might not take you. They might take you as a joke. Because the moment people start using slang, they're taken as jokers. The person is not serious. How do you use such a language in an office? You are both to your lecturer. And then the other thing is number four. Avoid what we call um, double message messages and misunderstanding. Avoid what we call a jargons. Use jargons judiciously. Don't use jargons every now and then. Our friend PLO Lumumba 
we will use jargon when speaking because communication is not the use of jargon. For a message to be communicated, use the simplest language ever. So you find like in a newspaper, use a language that even a standard two kid or a grade two can there and read and tell you what the newspaper is telling, what the newspaper is communicating. So use jargons judiciously. judiciously. So because uh, every profession has its own vocabulary, every profession, if you go to media, if you go to those people who are doing hospitality, go to those people who are doing IT, go to these people who are doing uh, engineering, they have their own jargons. So you cannot use engineering jargons to teachers, may, they may not understand or to your family members may not understand what you're saying. That way, they avoiding or using- chai. chai. Number next, uh, let's not number next, but the next thing, work on, uh, okay, we work on your verbal communication. As you set out to communicate verbally, yeah, it will be more successful if your words that have the same meaning to the person communicating. For you to improve your verbal communication, you will need to consider the following. What, what do you want to say? For example, if I want to communicate something, what do I want to communicate? You need to know, first of all, what you want to communicate. So in order to clear up any confusion, especially in public speaking, you must consider what it is that you want to say. Speakers who don't know exactly what they want to say end up confusing their audiences. You do in an attack may end up confusing your audiences. Number two, how do you want to say it? So once you have figured out how you want to say it, you may choose the language you are going to use. So when you use the language of abstraction and emotion, you must be very careful to define your language from your point of view. And then you must consider the people that you want to speak to. If you are speaking to children, then you have to lower yourself to their level. For example, if you are talking about the beach to the person from North Kenya, Northern Kenya, he is likely to have a little idea of how it feels to be on a beach, even though he may understand the concept intellectually. So to whom are you talking to? You know, there was a time I looked at CBC, lecturers teach, uh, not teachers teaching children how to swim. And you find that those areas that they do not have swimming pools, these children were told to lie down on the field and now start, you see, they, 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 they swim. They show that they are swimming by moving their hands or their arms and legs and hands eh? and the heads, the head, show that they are swimming, but they are on the sand. When you're communicating, make sure that you know the audiences that you're communicating. They really know what you're talking about. And then there is what we call meta message. And meta message is the meaning, is the meaning apart from what the actual word expresses. Eh? For example, uh, at a meeting in a branch manager's countrywide in Mombasa, the CEO introduces all the managers except the Kitale manager. So the manager assumes that this was a simple oversight. Imagine you've called uh, your managers somewhere and you are talking to them and you introduce all of them, apart from one. You as a manager who was doing the introduction, you may see it as a simple oversight. But to others, they may take it wrongly. They may say, number one, these people are not in terms. This person does not recognize the others. 
This one does not respect the manager from Kitale. People may interpret information differently, but on the, uh, the side of the manager, he may see it as if it was a simple oversight. So that is one thing. Eh? Number two is language choices. Uh, the language choices we are talking about, clarity. Be very clear of what you are saying. Avoid jargon, avoid slang, other complicated words that may not be understood, a specific other the general question. Power talk. Use power talk. Stop using words such as I guess. To know, nobody knows. I believe it is better that you say, I believe some of you know what I mean. For those who don't know what I mean, A, B, C, D. Don't use such words like, I guess, kind of, or to know, nobody knows what you're talking about. Again, be very vivid. To be vivid is to be very clear by creating an experience for the receivers of your messages. You can often make them feel what you felt. For example, maybe you are telling people on the first day you rode a horse. Make it clear such that they can feel what you felt. Or the first day you did what? You failed a test. Let these people know and feel exactly what you felt. Let it be so clear. These people can be able to, to do what? To understand what you are saying or what you are actually what you are saying. There is also what we call moral choices. We can cause considerable damage to others by choosing the wrong words. For example, I'm inviting you for a cup of tea. Instead of you telling me, I'll be very busy, I'm sorry, I will not be able to come. Others will say, I'm not interested. In some countries, they use, no, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in some countries, it's normal. Come to Kenya, I'm inviting you for a cup of tea, and you tell me I'm not interested. It will sound rude. It will sound rude. So insulting words can reduce an individual a mere weight. For example, when you call someone fat, especially ladies, if you are a lady, you are very fat. That lady may develop a very negative attitude towards you for the rest of her lifetime. So avoid such words. Avoid such words like saying, use your four eyes, or he has four eyes, to mean that he's putting on spectacles. Or even pig or dog, like we have just given an example of a dog. You have a dog as a neighbor, or you have a neighbor, you, uh, I mean, something like that. Eh? Avoid using such words like dog, pig, because these animals, they are perceived negatively. A pig is perceived as a very dirty animal. A dog also is perceived to be a very dirty animal. That's why you find ladies saying men are dogs. That's very bad. So we need to remember to make moral choices in our use of languages. And many of the choices we make not only determine how, our, um, how we present ourselves to others, but also decides the nature of our relationship in the years to come. So avoid those words that shows the other person is useless or that looks like you are abusing them. Like when you say this one is very short or this one is a dwarf, you, you meet a, a, a short person, you call him a dwarf or simply you call him a pygmy. My friend, you are abusing that person. So be very careful when you are making choices, when you're talking, because uh, it may determine how your relationship will be with that person. The relationship might be good, or it might be worse, or might be bad. So then how do you improve your verbal style, your verbal style of communicating? Number one, increase your vocabulary. 
we said as we when, when we began that the oral communication it gives you a room to improve the way you speak today you might not be speaking in the uh, in the next three years because you are improving your oral communication as you grow so improving your verbal styles number one you increase your vocabulary so when you hear a new word try to understand it in its context context is the environment we said last week that when you use some words in a different environment they may mean totally different things like for example ukisema ya kwamba this is huyu ni shoga yangu na tuko kwa darasa it may mean simply this is your friend but take a photograph of your friend who is a boy or your friend who is a girl two girls taking a photograph or two boys taking a photograph on bed they are on bed and then hapo uandike chini huyu ni kona huyu ni shoga yangu it may mean you are gay or it may mean you are homosexual or it may mean you are lesbian but if you are to say that in a class context or class class environment it may simply mean it is your friend so the way you use words use them right in their context because the environment can influence your your meaning number 2 adapt you are adapting your oral language so as you talk to people become conscious of them as particular individual for whom you need to adapt your message if you are speaking to children use the language of children so that they can understand what you are saying if you are talking to the old use a good language that they can understand that one shows respect and then breaking bad habits that although someone may tell you that you are making language mistakes such as poor grammar you will probably find it hard back yourself why because you are so accustomed to talking this way if you are also in an environment where mistakes are constantly being made example not uh, you are in an environment those people are in ghetto those who live in ghetto not all of them some find that um breaking the bad habit of speaking in sheng becomes very difficult because sheng is the language of the na ghetto is it becomes very difficult so you are being told breaking break those bad habits the way you speak the way you articulate words by eloquence the way you read the way you pronounce words the way you address people like in ghetto you'll find niaje buda bus zai kind of words those words if you don't get that bad habit you might end up you 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 are a called to give a speech the elderly you are called to give a speech to the youth you may end up using the sheng and the sheng might you know, sometimes when you use such words in sheng it shows how much disrespect so people might uh, develop a very negative uh, relationship with you because they may see as if you don't respect them so that's why we na sema ya kwamba hizo tabia za kizamani jaribu uwezavyo uachane nazo especially when you speak because these tabias uh si nzuri so there are what we call uh this is an example give five advantages and five disadvantages of television as a means of communication in Kenya from is a question and uh, we call it a day is there any question up to that point any question up to that point any clarification that you need any clarification that you need or you want let me let me unmute you 
have unmuted you, you can raise your hand, you can say, you can ask a question. Is anything you want to know? Just lift your hands or you unmute yourself and ask the question. Then we call it a day. Any question? If there is no, uh, somebody is lifting his hand up, this is uh, Habiba Abdile. Do you have a question? Or oh, your hand has remained lifted up or since we started the class? Habiba Ukonaswali. Hakunaswali. Now, I've finished my class. I want to give some information here uh, that is going to be very important to you. Uh, one of the information is that uh, those people who have just joined us today, uh, you can follow us through because there is a link that uh, I recorded a video of uh, the previous class. And that one is in on the portal. What you do is that you go and listen to that recording. Once you click, it takes you to YouTube. You listen to it. And uh, after you listen to it, then uh, you'll be at par with us. Another thing is that uh, last week, those who are not there, we created a group. And in this group, I chose one of us to be the class rep of the group. The purpose of this uh, admin is to ensure that uh, those who are not able to join, she can, she can, she can do what she can help her. She can help him or her join the particular group, and also other, other things. Eh? They may require some things or some information or uh, some information. So I'll be going to this class rep so that I can get those information. Now I am sharing a link. I'm sharing a link to this group. Make sure you click on the link and you join the class. You join the WhatsApp. That is where I will be be communicating with you in case of anything. So I've shared the link with you. I've shared the link with you. Once you click on the link, you it will just take you directly to WhatsApp. I can see some people are joining. Yeah, some people have joined are joining. I can see that 32 people have joined. Uh, another thing is uh, activities that are there. Uh, those activities have been synchronized with the attendance register. The activities of the day today. So today we are going to have a discussion forum. We are going to have a quiz. Discussion forum and quiz two. This discussion forum and quiz two they have been synchronized with the attendance register. That you have to do the discussion forum first. So you have to start with the discussion forum first. So do not start with the quiz. If you start with the quiz, it will not open. You have to start with the discussion forum first for it to give you the permission to do the quiz. So if you start with the quiz, it will not open. You start with the discussion forum first. Once you finish with the discussion forum, then the system gives you the permission to do the quiz. So then you do the quiz. After you do the quiz, your attendance will be marked automatically. It's as simple as that. If you fail to do them, you will remain absent and the attendance closes exactly at five. So by the time you are done with the activities, those activities you must done 
you must do them between now and 5 p.m. Because he darasa in a five years as a kumina moja. Kisha jifunga, a kumina moja, then it will mark you absent. Kama hauta kome vanyazile activities. So make sure that you do those activities for the system to mark you present. And begin with the discussion forum. Because the quiz will not open until you finish the discussion forum. It's as simple as that. So therefore, I have unleashed today's notes. As we speak right now, you can download those notes, the one that I was taking you through. You can open those notes as we speak right now. The second thing is, I think, uh, Maybe I can read those discussion forum. The discussion forum reads like this, differentiate or discuss the differences in denotation and connotation. What is denotation? What is connotation? Discuss the differences. Quiz two, it states with examples, we state with examples where verbal communication is mostly applied. How do you apply verbal communication mostly? It's as simple as that. Once you do those activities, the system, the end, at five, it will mark present. If you fail to do them, then you have yourself to blame because you will not be allowed to sit for the exam because of failure to do what? Because of failure to attain 75% of class attendance. Don't come crying to me. Mualimu, you marked me absent and I was present. No, I have no control over that the attendance register. No, it is in the control. The control is in your hands. Control is in the system. Just do the right thing. Any question? Any question? Then if there is no question, I'll end my class there. For the remaining time, just go and do the activities that have been aligned there for you. Have a very good evening.